We're going to look at verses 14 through 17. Actually, we're going to back up to verse 13. Romans 1, 13. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented. In order that I may reap some harvest among you, as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to the Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. This is God's word. Mike Johnson, would you come and just lead us in a word of prayer as we hear God's word this morning? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for this beautiful day that you've given us, Lord, and for the mighty way that you're at, at work here in Pine City. Lord, this morning we pray that you would give Pastor Joel your words to say, Lord, that you, that, uh, you would open our hearts to what you want us to learn and teach us and how you want us to be more like Christ. Lord, please mold us in, into the image of your Son and keep us safe today and do all things for your glory. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. authentically, to enjoy Christ's supremacy, to cherish scripture mightily, to care for each other passionately, to reach out tenderly with the saving message of Jesus Christ. Thank you. <clears throat> Driven by the gospel. And supported with prayer. We exist. To worship God authentically. To enjoy Christ's supremacy. To cherish scripture mightily. To care for each other passionately. To reach out tenderly. With the saving message of Jesus Christ. You've just seen and heard our church's mission statement presented by several people of different ages from our church family. It was written several years ago as a way to concisely state uh, what we want to represent as a church family. We publish it every week in the bulletin. Um, we show it on the screens during the announcements. I try to reference it from time to time when it fits the passage I'm scripturing, uh, preaching from. And we understand that it is not scripture. But just like the moon reflects the light of the sun, what this statement does is it richly represents the great themes of the Bible. And so let's do this. Let's all read it together. I'll put it on the screens for you. Here we go. Ready? Driven by the gospel and supported with prayer, we exist to worship God authentically, enjoy Christ's supremacy, cherish Scripture mightily, care for each other passionately, and reach out tenderly, with the saving message of Jesus Christ. Each fall, I try to focus my preaching on some aspect of the church or church life. You know, it's, even though it's not New Year like we celebrate, in some ways it almost kind of is in our schedule because kids are going back to school, uh, everything's kicking off, it's football season again. So we're all kind of excited. And so I try and focus that. So for the next several weeks, we're going to break down the various parts of our mission statement. Um, and this, so this sermon series will be a little bit more thematic in nature. Um, and my hope, though, is this. And my prayer is that God will give us a united vision for our church as we move forward together for the gospel in our community. And so today we're going to look at this phrase, driven by the gospel. But in order for us to focus on the gospel... 
The first thing I want to deal with is there are some widespread misunderstandings about the nature of what the gospel actually is. So I want to focus on those. So the first thing we're going to look at is this, what the gospel is not. What the gospel is not. We know that the word gospel comes from a Greek word, euangelion, which means simply good news. It was a word that was actually used even in a secular way to just announce good news, whether it was a winning of a military battle or, or a, a, an announcement of a marriage. And of course it was adopted by, by Christ and by others to mean the good news of Jesus. And so, but it's used a lot today in church culture. It's also used a lot today even in our secular culture sometimes. And we all know that words can have different meanings to different people, don't we? The other day, I was talking to some students before our first youth group, and they were sitting around there eating Subway sandwiches. How many of you like Subway sandwiches? Okay, I like them too. In fact, I just love the way a sandwich smells, especially if it's got onions on it. Mmm, it just smells good. So they were talking, and they were, they were eating their subs, and, and I happened to mention, I grew up in New Jersey, so we actually called subs, we called them hoagies. And so I said, man, you guys are eating hoagies, huh? And their response was hilarious. They went, oh, these are not hoagies. These are subs. Hoagies are those disgusting sandwiches they try and feed us at school lunches. <laughs> and I thought, wow, words can mean different things to different people. And that's true. So, so let's just talk briefly about what the gospel is not. Number one. The gospel is not a set of religious rules that help us get to God or somehow earn his favor. Millions of people in our world have been deceived into believing that if they will just do whatever their religion tells them to do, no matter how extreme, they can somehow earn God's favor and friendship. But Paul told Titus the exact opposite. Here's what he said. He said that God saved us, listen to this, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Paul says it is not by any religious work. Religious works are not the gospel. You can do all the religious works in the world and still not know Christ. Secondly, the gospel is not a health and wealth scheme. Many people, and what, what breaks my heart about it is many people, especially poor people and sick people, who are just looking for any way at all to ease their pain and misfortune, many of them have been deceived, have been lied to have been taken advantage of and told that if they will just follow some preacher's words and, of course, give money to their ministry, then they will be healed and they'll be whole of all their problems. Sometimes it's even taught that poverty, sickness, and suffering happen to us because of our own sin. This evil is often called the prosperity gospel. And, folks, it is not the true biblical gospel. In fact, listen to Jesus' own words. He lifted up his eyes on his disciples and he said, Blessed are you. How many want to be blessed by Jesus? Listen to this. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. And Jesus says this, Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven, for so their fathers did to the prophets. The gospel is not a health and wealth scheme where all your problems go away if you just invite Jesus into your life. That is not the biblical gospel. Number three, the gospel is not a political position. Now, understand, that is not to say that Christians should not be involved in the political process. 
We absolutely should. It is one of the great ways that we can serve our communities and we can serve our country by letting the truth of God's word guide how we vote. However, we need to always remember, folks, that no government on earth will ever bring about the kingdom of God. Jesus said it very clearly. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not have been delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world. The gospel is not a political position. And then lastly, the gospel is not a free pass for everyone to go to heaven. See, there are those who kind of teach this idea that because Jesus died for everyone, then everyone's just going to go to heaven. Um, this may be a nice thought, and it may somewhat ease people's guilty consciences, but folks, it is not the truth of the gospel. Jesus spoke of eternal punishment and made a clear distinction between those who receive him and those who reject him. He said this, and these, speaking of those who receive Jesus, these will go away, excuse me, he said, and these, speaking of those who reject Christ, these will go away into eternal punishment. But the righteous, those who receive Christ, into eternal life. So folks, we need to understand, there are a lot of misconceptions about what the gospel actually is. So the question is, okay, what is the gospel? How many of you have ever been misled by your GPS before? Now, I, I don't know this for sure. I haven't done the research. But I am convinced that GPSs were invented by an incredibly frustrated wife who was upset with her husband because he would not stop and ask for directions. So they decided, we're going to create a GPS that's going to tell him what to do. And did you ever notice GPSs are always in a woman's voice? I'm just saying. We have all been misled by our GPSs from time to time. The very first time I ever took JJ to the orthodontist, I was down in Maple Grove, and people, I love it when people talk to me about Minnesota. I say, where are you from? Oh, I grew up here. And to most people, they may understand where, you know, Timbuktu, Minnesota is, but I'm like, I know where Pine City is, I know where Duluth is, and sometimes I can find the cities. I mean, so I was following this GPS, and it kept telling me to make a U-turn. And then I'd go make a U-turn, and I'd go back, now make a U-turn. I'm like, wait a minute. And then it sent me around a circle. And this way, it said, make a U-turn. I'm like, now, I would love to tell you that I didn't yell at the GPS. But I should not lie. But the truth is this. That if we are going to get to a destination, the directions must be clear and they must be correct. Is that right? Folks, in the same way, if we are going to be driven by the gospel, then we must be clear on what the gospel actually is. So what is the gospel? Simply put, it's this. The gospel is the good news of God's provision for humanity's sinfulness. It is God providing for our sin. It is the good news of that story. Paul summed up the gospel in this way. He said it this. I love this verse. He said, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. See, God sent Jesus to die for us, not because we were good enough, not because we were really nice people, but just because he loved us. It is God who took the initiative to provide the perfect sacrifice for our sins. And whenever you feel uncertain of God's love for you, remember this. God loved you long before you ever turned to him. God did not start loving him when you accepted the gospel. God has always loved you. God's plan was to send Christ to die for mankind. And even while we were sinners, Christ died for us. So let me give you the gospel summed up in four points. First of all, 
The story of the gospel, the good news, starts with this idea. God created us in his own image. Genesis 1.27 tells us that. Now, we may not know exactly what that exactly means, that we're created in God's image. There's lots of ideas. But we do know this, that what it means for us and what it teaches us is that all human life is inherently valuable. God created us. God loves us. And God owns us. The Bible says it this way, Psalm 100, Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. You see, when we understand that we were created in the image of God and all life is valuable, we understand that no one is a mistake. We all have value because God made us. Sadly, though, the second part of the gospel message is this, and it is that sin broke us and marred God's image within us. See, in order to understand how good the good news really is, we also have to understand how bad the bad news really is. In fact, Ephesians says it this way, we understand that sin broke us completely. Ephesians says it this way, before Christ, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. And that really hit home to me this week. I was reading and studying, and I read it, came across the statement. It says this, The gospel doesn't make bad people good. It makes dead people alive. That's what the gospel does. And that's the difference between the gospel and every other human religion. And because we are so completely broken by the gospel, or, excuse me, by, by sin... Theologians call that total depravity. We all have within us this brokenness, so we want to mess with God. We want to fix God. We think that God should be a lot more like us. When we look at the world and we see suffering, we think, well, i got to invent some kind of a God that can handle that, that can make me feel good about myself. And so we mess with him, or we just push him aside. When we see God coming, we just go the other way. We, and even when we hear things like this, we hear the warnings of the Scripture and preaching that a life built on avoiding God is, is, is eternally futile. We kind of, in our mind, we reason with it. We say, well, maybe, but maybe not. I'll just take my chances. And so we all reject God. And here's what the Scripture says. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And it even says in James 1.15 that sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Now the question is this, how in the world do we dig ourselves out of that? Well, you know what the answer is, we can't. But here's the good news, it is that Jesus came to save us. Paul said it so clearly in 1 Timothy, he said, Christ Jesus came to save sinners. God in his love sent Jesus Christ as the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Jesus lived for us the perfect life we could never live. He died the guilty death that we really deserved. Jesus is our substitute. And he nailed our sin to his cross. In fact, here's what the scripture says in Isaiah 53. That the Lord laid on Jesus, ready for this? The iniquity of us all. All of our sin was nailed to Jesus' cross. He came to save us. And finally, God invites us, here's the last point, God invites us now to respond to Jesus by faith. Verse 17 of Romans 1 says that the just, the righteous, will live by faith. The only response to the gospel that God accepts is faith, is belief. And it is simply this, it is our empty hands opening up to receive all that Jesus did for us. The Bible says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one may boast. The idea is this, that Jesus did everything for us, and we add nothing. And you know what? Humanity hates that because we're so prideful. But that is what God wants. And it's so kind of God to do it that way. Don't you think it's incredibly gracious and kind of God to do it all for us? Rather than God saying, well, here, I'll do 99% and you do the 1%. Because I got news for you. I would not meet the 
I would fall flat on my face. And anybody would. Thomas Goodwin once said it this way. He said, why did God choose faith to save us? Because the poorest and the weakest in the world can believe and trust. And the scripture says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. See, that's what the gospel is. Creation, God created us. Sin broke us, the fall. Jesus came to save us, that's grace. And faith is how we respond to the gospel. And that is our only part of it. And I love the old gospel hymn that says it this way. Jesus paid it what? All. So all to him I owe. That's the truth of the gospel. Now, let's look at back in the book of Romans and let's talk about the power of the gospel. Let me read to you 14 through 16 again. Paul says, I am under obligation, both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you who are also in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. If you look at those verses again, you see three I am statements of Paul. He says, I'm under obligation. He says, I am eager to preach. And he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. So what was it about the gospel that affected Paul so deeply? First of all, Paul knew by experience that the gospel changes everything. He says in verse 16 that the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. He says something similar. I want to show you this verse, 1 Corinthians 1.18. He says that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. That word power comes from a Greek word, dunamis, where we get our word dynamite from. That's where that word comes from. And although the message may sound crazy to the outside world, understand this, the gospel works to change lives because it has the omnipotent power of God backing it. You know what? It is only the power of God that can overcome humanity's sinful nature and give us a new life that comes in Jesus Christ. We cannot do it our own. No one can woo us into it. It is the power of God that must do it. When a man or woman is touched by the gospel, their life is truly changed. All throughout history, the gospel has left in its wake testimonies of people whose lives have been changed by it. And there's no greater illustration in the entire Bible than the person who wrote these verses, the Apostle Paul. Paul was a persecutor of Christians. He wanted them done away with. He wanted to destroy the Christian faith. He did not believe in Jesus. He thought he was a false Messiah. But then one day, he met Christ on the road to Damascus. And it was there that he saw the light. And he was saved, and his life was changed by Christ. Charles Spurgeon, who was a great preacher from the 19th century, said about the power of the gospel this. He said, see what power the gospel has. Plunge her under the wave, and she rises purer from the washing. Thrust her into the fire, and she comes out the more bright for her burning. Cut her in sunder, and each piece shall make another church. Behead her, and like the hydra of old, she shall have a hundred heads for every one you cut away. She cannot die. She must live, for she has the power of God within her. See, the gospel is the living message of hope that brings life to those who are dead in their trespasses and sins. It is the gospel that brings new birth and changes a person. And, and it doesn't change the outside first. The gospel doesn't mean, hey, get yourself cleaned up and you can become a Christian. No, the gospel changes us from the inside out. And that's why I read this this week. I thought it was so good. John Phillips, a commentator, said, The world does not need a better system of education. It does not need more social reform. It does not need new ideas in religion. It needs the gospel. The gospel message grips the mind, stabs the conscience, warms the heart, saves the soul, and sanctifies the life. It can make drunk people sober, crooked people straight, and immoral people pure. It is the message that is sufficient enough to transform the life of anyone who believes. See, the gospel just changes everything. And this life-changing power is exactly why the Apostle Paul 
was driven by the gospel. In verses 14 and 15, he, he, he expresses this deep obligation to preach the gospel. It made him ready, willing, and able to go to Rome, which was the seat of the power of the world. And he was willing to go there and preach the gospel because he knew that the gospel had the very power of God behind it. He was so driven that, this is what he told the church in Corinth, he said, if I preach the gospel, it gives me no ground for boasting, for necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. I mean, that's being driven. This past Monday, we remembered what happened on 9-11 16 years ago. How many of you can remember the place where you were when that happened? I can remember it. I was in college. I was in a, interestingly enough, as I, I didn't think about this earlier, but interestingly enough, I was in Romans class. And when that happened and we left class and they had a TV on in the room and we kind of saw what was going on. And, we, and it's one of the worst, most horrible tragedies in American history. But there were also a lot of heroes that day, weren't there? Maybe some of them we know about, like we, we, we've probably, most of us have heard of Todd Beamer, who very famously said, let's roll, as he and a group of passengers overtook uh, United Airlines Flight 93. They overtook the terrorists. They crashed the plane in a field in Pennsylvania. They believe that was headed directly for the White House. But others we don't know as well. I mean, so many firemen, police officers, first responders, military personnel, even regular citizens just join together to try and save people's lives. And one name you may not know, not as famous, is the name Rick Rescorla. Anybody ever heard that name, Rick Rescorla? There's a picture of him and his wife. I want to watch his story. Sometimes in life, ordinary people do extraordinary things, don't they? The question for us today is this, what are we driven by? Rick Rescorla was driven by his responsibility as a soldier, as a security director, and honestly and truly, as a human being to run into the danger as everyone else ran out. You know, we're all ordinary people here today, but we are called to something so infinitely greater than saving people's lives from a burning building. Just as the Apostle Paul was consumed with spreading the gospel to all people across all cultural, social, racial, and economic lines, we are obliged to Christ because he took the punishment for our sins. And we can never repay him 
for all that he's done, but we can demonstrate our loyalty and our gratitude by showing his love to others. And it'll only happen if we are driven by the gospel. I know. I, I was taught, having a conversation with Dan Pouille this week about first responders and military personnel, people who run into the danger when everyone else runs away. It's incredible to meet people like that, to think about people like that. And I know that the world, and sometimes even other Christians, kind of give you the idea, hey, do what's safe. Take care of yourself. Don't be too committed to the gospel because it might cost you something. Folks, we need to be the kind of people that run in to our communities with the gospel. This week, I am asking for all of us to take a very serious action step. And that is to ask ourselves, and most importantly, to ask God, what am I driven by? Throughout the history of the church, both globally and even this church, and churches in this community, We've gone through times where we were driven by something other than the gospel. Sometimes even good things. But it has hurt the cause of Christ in our world. And it has hurt his church deeply. I don't know about you, but my desire is that the greatest days of our church be ahead, in front of us. But I truly believe this with every fiber of my being that it cannot and will not happen unless and until we are truly united in being driven by the gospel and nothing else. We're going to take a moment of quiet before I pray. And I just want you to ask yourself and God that question. What am I driven by? What drives my life? And as we go through this week, we need to continue to ask that question. What am I driven by? Is it the gospel or is it something else? And as God reveals to our hearts the things that we are driven by, my prayer is that we will confess them that we will sincerely ask God, God, help me, make me to be driven by the gospel in every area of my life. Let's just take a moment of quiet. God, your word says all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to our own way. Lord, I will be the first to confess that there are many times in my life that I have been driven by something other than the gospel. And Lord, I confess it as sin. I confess it, God, that I've let other things be more important to me. But Lord, I'm so, so grateful that your word also goes on to say that you laid on Christ the iniquity of us all, that you put all of our sin on Christ and every bit of it was nailed to his cross. So Lord, we, we ask forgiveness today both personally and corporately for those times in our lives where 
pleasures, money, entertainment, programs, formalities, our own popularity, whatever it may be, our own weaknesses even, that we, they have driven us. And Lord, you call us as your people to be driven by the gospel. As Paul was, Lord, may we be, may we realize we are under obligation because of the gospel. May we be ready and eager to share Christ with those in our community. May we work towards relationships that give us the right to speak Christ into people's lives. And may we not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ because we know it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. For our family members, for our neighbors, for those we go to school with, for those we go to work with. Lord, we know that the gospel is the life-changing power of God. So God, we ask, what are we driven by? Reveal to us the answers, Lord. Give us the grace to repent when we need to. Give us the grace, Lord, to be driven by the gospel in our hearts and minds. And we pray this, Lord, as individuals and as a congregation, may we be driven by the gospel. In Christ's name, amen.